All right, so today we are talking about knowledge graph. And if you're very excited and you wanna get into making a knowledge graph and you wanna model and make an ontology and do some fun things, we have some talking to do before we get there. So today we're going to be talking about eight different things to think about before you get into a graph database situation. So these are all situational. These are questions to ask yourself before you get started. How do I know knowledge graph is for me? So the number one thing to think about is, do you actually have a lot of relational data? So you might think I have a relational database. Of course I have relational data. Mm, no, maybe not. So if you find yourself doing a lot of joins between different tables, then you might actually have a lot of data that has very interesting relationships or relationships that are not being satisfied by a relational database. So what does that mean? So if you are constantly doing queries, uh, trying to find, so if I am your client and you wanna find all the people that are named Ashley, and then you wanna find all of the products that people named Ashley have purchased and how much those products are. So those would be quite a few joins because you probably have a table of customers, you have another table of purchases, what, what product they actually purchased, and then another table that's saying what the price of that product was. So you can see one, two, three different types of tables and you'd have to join those all together doing a query for each to get an aggregation of data to answer your question. If you are doing queries like this constantly, if you're constantly asking questions where you have to do more than two hops, so I'm going to say hops instead of joins here. So it's, I have a person and then I have to do another hop and that's usually okay. You don't necessarily need a knowledge graph for that. I have a person, Ashley, and I need to make a hop, and Ashley has purchased a cell phone. Okay, cool. Ashley, cell phone. Awesome. But what if I wanna know how much that cell phone cost? Oh, now I gotta go do another query. You can see how this can get very complicated, and that's a pretty straightforward question that I just asked. So if you are constantly asking questions that's a key to understanding if you need knowledge graph or not. What kind of questions are you asking and how often? If you're asking that question, how often did Ashley buy a cell phone and how much it was? If you're not asking that question very often, maybe your, your traditional relational database with your uh, SQL kind of queries is gonna be totally fine. But if you're constantly asking these questions, it takes a lot of time it's a lot of money to actually conduct those queries. And you actually have a lot of duplication because I might be making those same queries and thinking logically through those hops and somebody else doing those same queries might make different logical assertions and make a different table on those things. Then you get a big explosion of data. Oh, and it's so hard to maintain when you have this giant cloud of data hanging over you. This is a common thing that I talk about, the, the cloud data. And I don't mean data on the cloud. I am saying a giant thunder cloud of data that you don't know what it is, you don't know who touched it last, you don't know how it was joined and what it's doing. It's a thunder cloud because at any moment it could pour down on you and you have no idea what's going on. So not, not great for compliancy, not great for um, making sure you don't get data bloat, other things that do cost a lot of time, money, and resources. So, great, Ashley, that means that if I go with a graph database, all of that's solved for me. No, that's, that's not true, but graph database does allow you to model things in a way so that you don't have to do all those hops yourself. You are almost pre-programming those hops in. Every time I talk about hop in a traditional relational database, there is no way to understand what that hop is. It's just a join of two different tables. Well, what if I could explicitly say what that join or that hop was about? If I wanted to find 
all of the products that people named Ashley have actually purchased. Instead of just having two tables, one says purchased, and then I have to make another table that says returned, if I only wanted to look at things that were purchased, should I have to duplicate all of that data? No, I can have all of the products in, in one kind of category, right? So these are products and these are what they are. And I can have a relation of returned and I can have a relation called purchased. So instead of having to join all of these different tables that have um, those, those relations kind of dictated in the name of the table, instead I can actually just query off of the relation if I am using a graph database. It's one of the big perks of, of having it and that should save you that time, money, and resources if you know what those common questions are. So understand if you have relations and how to what extent, understand how many hops and joins you typically do, and how much time, money, and resources do you usually spend on these things. Document those things. Those are very important for this decision-making process. The other thing is make sure you document what questions you are going to be asking, not queries, that's later. Don't focus on the query at this point. What questions are you commonly asking of your data? Or what questions would you like to ask your data? And it's just not providing the answers for that or it's not providing it effectively. So those are the top three things to think about. So additional things to think about, those top three are really the top three. Really focus on those. Do those really well, do your due diligence on them. The next one is what kind of existing databases and structures do you already have? Because if you're making a decision to go into graph and you're using a database already for your, your information that's not really compatible with any kind of graph database, um, that doesn't mean you can't use it. It just means you're gonna have a lot more effort to do so. A lot of traditional relational databases are adding graph-like components. So Mongo, for instance, has a graph component. I believe Oracle does. If you're using things in Salesforce, I know they have the Einstein engine that goes with that. So a lot of Amazon also, it's, it's connecting Neptune to all of its types of databases. So there's definitely options out there, but keep in mind there are different types of graph. There's property graphs, and then there's triple stores. We will go all through that in a different video, but understanding upfront what kind of data databases you are currently working with is really imperative to then going forward in your decision process. What kind of query language do you and your staff or the people that are gonna be working with this, your users, what do they know? That's, that's a big hurdle that a lot of people struggle with when they get into graph, but suffice it to say, if you have people on staff that know object-oriented programming languages, they should be able to pick up on either of these pretty well. If you don't know object-oriented programming, for instance, like Java or um, C and you know those, uh, you will have a harder path um, to get people on board to actually be able to query the databases that you're gonna be setting up in the graph space. So let's say you have that figured out. Um, do you actually have any existing graph data? Because if you don't, then you have to go through the process of making an ontology and then populating it with your actual data. So remember, an ontology is the framework, the schema, and then the knowledge graph is populating that schema. So you might say, well, uh, yeah, I don't have any graph data or I would have a graph database. It's not actually true. I mean, sometimes you can have people that are, you know, playing around with data or people that are experimenting with things like with neo 4 and, you know, they have something that's already in a graph form, or maybe you are constantly working with um, external data that you bring in and you make it into a relational database when really that thing started out, that, that, that data that you're bringing in started out life as a graph. So if you understand you know, what your problem space is gonna look like, that's gonna be very helpful for you because if you already have something that's graph, first, you already have something to test when you're starting to set up a graph database. And then the second is 
most likely somebody at your company made it and they also know how to, you know, query it and, and work with that kind of data. And they can be your champions or they can be some of the people you can use to start out if, if that's what you're doing. The other thing you have to think about is if you have a lot of structure in your data that is highly complex, uh, sometimes people that did not realize graph existed or it wasn't mature enough when the data was, was structured, put a lot of things into relational databases that actually belongs in a graph. So if you go in and you start to see a lot of things that are trying to evoke um, relations, very explicit relations, like this thing is an author of this, not an editor, an author, like a very explicit kind of relation. That also is a good indication that you should be going into the graph space. All right, so the last two things are more on the side where um, you, you've already made um, some decisions that you want to get into graph. And so the first here is, do you actually have any downstream systems that will use graph data? So, okay, I got my graph data and I've got my graph database and now I can go and play and make things beautiful for my users. Well, does your your interface know how to use um, graph data to visualize things? Does your um, recommendation engine know how to use relational data from a graph? Have you connected it to the graph database? Have you done your testing on whether the users actually agree with the recommendations or the machine learning or whatever it is you're using that knowledge graph for? More on use cases in the next video, by the way. You have to ask yourself those things because you can do all of this upfront, really great resource dedication and get some cool things put together. But if you don't have anything downstream of the pipeline that's going to use it, it's gonna sit on a shelf and it's gonna get old, it's gonna get dusty and data shouldn't get dusty. <laughs> it just shouldn't. So just make sure that you understand what your roadmap is gonna look like so that if you are building something out and you have to depend on somebody else, to build out the front end or the machine learning or the recommendation engine or the chat bot that's going to use your data, make sure that you're in lockstep with them so that when you are ready to go out the gate, so are they. All right, the very last thing is maintenance. I think when I talk to, at least personally, to a lot of engineers and a lot of data scientists, it's all about, you know, the big bang. Let's get this big thing out. Let's do this amazing stuff. It does great things way, way, way better than anything else. Awesome. That can all be true. But how do you maintain it? So anybody will tell you that has tried to update a knowledge graph, especially if you're using any kind of mix of internal and external data, it's a nightmare. So make sure when you go into this, you understand what, what kind of criteria you're going to use for calculating the differences between the data sets. Understand what is going to be added to the graph and what is not going to be added to the graph. How are you doing your validation checks? How are you doing your quality checks along the way? Is it okay to only have automated quality checks or do you have to have a team that knows graph and or knows the subject matter that you're working with in order to correct the graph when it needs to be corrected. You don't want to get into a situation where you have built out this whole pipeline of knowledge graph only for at the end, everyone signs off and says, this is awesome, this is great, and then it becomes outdated in a few months. That's a horrible situation to find yourself in. Don't make that mistake. Those were my top eight considerations for when you want to start thinking about graph technology. And in the next video, I'm going to talk a little bit about some use cases and show some cool stuff off and actually present a lot of research that's free that you can go and access yourself. So with that, thank you very much and I'll catch you next time.